I'd like to welcome Stanley. He's um, agreed to come and give us a talk about Polynesian navigation in the Pacific, and we know how the Pacific peoples moved over really big distances across the Pacific Ocean between the islands. And he is going to share his knowledge of this with us. So thanks very much for coming along, Stan. Awesome. <laughs> 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 oh, kia ora I think it took me the e babi tuku te karakia mō tātou i rotu i tō tātou matu nui ki te rangi i te pōne i ngā mihi atu ki a koe tinu hari koa ka tūtaki i tēnei pō i, I, I a koe a tinu hari koa nō no rena mihi atu ki a koe te matu hari koa huri atu ki a koutou katoa a, a ngā a koutou mai tāma i te pōne i ngā mihi atu ki a koutou a toko ingo ko Stanley Conry a nō rena nō ki ora tātou katoa um, yeah, awesome. Well, it's, um, I've done a lot of guest speaking <laughs> over, over the few days, and especially with Matariki, and um, but, uh, I have a bit of, a bit of Arawa about my voice cracking and stuff like that. It's, it's been full on pretty much, um, but that's what it's all about. Um, my name's Stan Conrad. Um, I hail from the very far north in a little place called Te Kol. And um, and I'm my tribe, my fucker papa is um, my walker is Mamari and Tinana. My mountain is Tafi Tafi Tirahi. My awa, my river is Te Aupuka. My moana is Paringa Ringa Harbour. My marae is Potahi. My fare tupuna is Waimiri Rangi. And that's my fucker papa. That's my genealogy. I take my waka, which is Mamari and Tinana. Mamari on my dad's side, Tinana on my mum's side. Those are my ancestral wakas, the wakas that arrived here in Aotearoa. And that's, that's, that's my identity, who I am. And it's the same with um, a lot of our Māori throughout, the, throughout the Aotearoa can trace their whakapapa back to their ancient, their ancient waka that arrived here in Aotearoa. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's who I am. And on my German side, on my dad's side, well, that's a different story. My, 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 my great-grandfather was a, a, a captain, and um, he, was, uh, he was one of the first to bring the first of the British soldiers here to uh, Taranaki, to the Taranaki Wars, um, which, yeah, it's, it's, that's, that's, and that's my grandfather on, on my dad's side, my great-great-grandfather. And my great-great-grandfather on my mum's side, who's Scottish, his name was John Borrowdale. And um, he was a uh, survey for the for 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 the for the government for the British government. He was sent here to do a lot of survey. He ended up in this uh, this island in uh, Tauranga Moana called uh, Matakana Island. Ended up he, he ended up with a, a local woman there, and then he didn't like to do any of that survey, so he pretty much ran off. And then they were looking for him, and they found him. Well, they didn't find him anyway. They found him in a little. He ended up in a little place called Whangape, just north of the of the Hokianga Harbour, and that's where um, my mum comes from. He's a, she's a Murray. So, German on my dad's side, Scottish on my mum's, and in between, I got a bit of splattering of a Yugoslavian um, in the in amongst that. But um, both were seagoing people. My grand, my my Scottish grandfather, great great grandfather, built flat bottom scows. Um, and my grandfather, well, he sailed, sailed ships. <coughs> my life, I'm, a, I'm actually a fisherman, qualified uh, fisherman by trade. Yeah, I wanted to go to the Navy, but my dad pulled me out of the Navy, didn't want me to go to the Navy. He sent me off to fishing school, so to come home and run the fishing business in, in, in the parting of Harbour. So I'm, I'm a fisherman by trade. And I've been, been in the ocean since I was a, a wee one for a long, long time, and I've you know, ocean is, 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 is me. I love the ocean. And um, that's how I was brought up, um, being in the ocean. I got involved in Waka in 1974 um, when we relaunched the ancient voyaging uh, Waka, traditional Waka called Natoki Matafaurua in Waitangi. My dad skipped that in 1974. I was 11 years old and I first saw a Waka, a paddling Waka then, and I was just amazed by it at the time. And I 
started doing waka, paddling, um, traditional wakas, um, our ceremony waka back in those days. And I've been doing that for, uh, since I was 11. And in 1985, <clears throat> I had the opportunity to be selected as a crew member on a voyaging canoe called Hoku Lea. And that was on a voyage of rediscovery. And I got on that voyaging canoe in 1985 in Rarotonga, and I first ever sat on the ocean on a voyaging canoe from Rarotonga to New Zealand, navigated traditionally by a young Hawaiian navigator by Nainua Thompson. And that's where I got my first taste of what voyaging was all about. I was a bit scared. <laughs> Being young, of course, I was quite arrogant. I was very, very arrogant. My thought about our ancestors arriving when I, when I grew up was my ancestors came here by, um, by sailing boat. My ancestors came here by plane. That's how I was brought up. That's what I was brought up. And then when I got on this voyaging canoe in 1985 from Rarotonga to, to New Zealand, I, after that voyage, I saw another side in which I wanted to get involved in. And then I sort of pretty much dedicated 10 years of my life just just soaking up voyaging, learning about voyaging canoes, learning about ocean voyaging, and then to the step of learning how to navigate. Pretty much just, I was just immersed in it. And it was lucky um, these two people that, are, that you'll see um, helped me through that. And of course, with my uncle, Sir Hector Busby, um, we started this amazing, amazing journey and this amazing ability and amazing learning about my ancestors, about how they voyage, how they navigate these amazing vessels across. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty, you know, the, the, just a smidgen of what I, I do. But anyway, this painting. I grew up with this painting when I was at school. This is what I was taught. And, I, and this is what I was taught by people back then about my ancestors. And I was taught there were only two theories, two theories that my two th ways my ancestors arrived here in Aotearoa. One was by a storm, and the other was accidental. And that's how I grew up. And, I, and in that time, I was thinking, wow, stupid. How could they do that? You know, how silly is my ancestor to sail like that? And this painting here, this sparked it off. This was the one that drove me when I became a little older and, and when I got voyaging again and I realized I'm going to revisit this painting and this is what I look at. This is what drives me to, this drove me to what I wanted to do and how I wanted to voyage and how I wanted to learn about navigation. And uh, this painting has uh, been the motivation. Ooh. And now... <laughs> Yeah, this is Te Aurere Waka. I skipped this, Did nav uh, navigate it. Not only me, but other guys navigated it, but I, I'm, I'm the, the original captain, or the original kaihautu of this waka. This is a waka that Hector built in 1991. And it set sail to Rarotonga in 1992 on its maiden voyage to Rarotonga. We were young. We were adventurous. We were called idiots. We were called uh, what are you guys what are you guys trying to prove? Um, but we set sail to Rarotonga in 1992 on Te Aurere Waka, and it made it to Rarotonga in '92, and it sailed. And I sailed. We sailed it back. Um, Te Aurere was built by Hector. It was Hector Busby's first ocean-going voyaging canoe. Built from two Cody trees from the Hirakino Forest, lashed together um, with, um, with um, manila rope. Um, the structure was all lashed together. There were no nuts and bolts, just all lashing. The types of sails we had on then was the, what we called Dacron, but we couldn't, have, couldn't hurry, couldn't afford to um, plait the sails because that took time. But we, um, we built it, Hector built it as close as possible to. Um, our traditional voyaging canoes. Um, it's 57 feet long, it's about seven and a half tons, and it's, uh, it's covered a lot of ocean in its lifetime. Um, it's been pretty much to all three points of the, 
what, all three points of the triangle to Hawaii um, and then, uh, then to, uh, uh, to Rapa Nui, to Easter Island. It's covered, tracked about maybe up to 80 to 100,000 nautical miles in its lifetime. So it's done a lot of mileage and um, yeah, we've sailed this thing pretty much, pretty much all through the Pacific. And, um, oh, geez. Yeah, all through the Pacific. When I stood, started learning about, <clears throat> about our ancestors, I started learning about, and I was getting back to those two theories, those two finger theories that I was taught about, that our ancestors were accidental sailors, or sailors are people from the storm. And then um, I got sailing with the Hawaiians back in those early 80s and those 80s. And when I used to travel after that voyage to Rarotonga, um, from Rarotonga to New Zealand in 1985, I did another sail on the same voyage to Hokulea back to Hawaii in 1987, and I did a lot of sailing around the Hawaiian lines, and, and I was trying to figure out where did my ancestors come from? Where were the originals? Where did our lineage or our, our connection came from? And then my, I, I learned a lot about North America, South America, back in those days when I was in school. And, um, and I learned that through, and I got to meet the guy too, um, when that uh, Hydor, Paul Hydor, built that Kantiki, and I had, the I had the privilege to actually meet him. It was amazing, amazing, amazing person. And I got to meet him, we t and I sort of sat with him, myself and Hector, and we sat when we talked about his, his um, voyage on, on, his, on, his, on, his, on, his, on his vessel, the Khan Tiki. And we listened to his stories, we listened to his, uh, his, his voyage and stuff, and um, that was good. You know, I, I, I loved it. I, I was just like, you know, you, you just, I just wanted to learn a lot more about about, about our Polynesian ancestors and about our Tupinas and how they traveled. And then um, through that, um, when I did a lot of sailing in Hawaii and stuff, got to meet another people like um, uh, one of our famous person, his name is um, Ben Finney, um, which I got to sail with him in 1985 and in 1987. Um, got to meet him really close because of his knowledge of anthropology and, and him got to meet Herb Carney back in those days, I met some amazing people that I would never, ever, ever, ever meet in my whole life. I got to meet them through voyaging. And I got to learn about a lot of stuff. And then I ended up um, learning about the, uh, the way our people, or talking about these three movements of, of Pol uh, to, into Polynesia itself. And um, the connection, when I found out, I learned about this piece of pottery, um, Lapita Ware, and how this piece of pottery connects us all the way back into Southeast Asia. And I, back then I was, I was still a little bit, uh, you know, like when you're at a young age, you're sort of still trying to get think your head around a lot of things. And um, it's over time when I grew up and I, I was getting older and older and, getting, and I was trying to put, join dots together and I was getting to learn a bit more about it. And yeah, just this, when I saw this piece of pottery and, and actually looked at the history and the story and the, 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 the connection on how, where it came from, um, yeah, I got my head around it a lot more and then ended up got to the point where, oh wow, amazing how, how this, these, the movement of our ancestors from Southeast Asia into um, Melanesia, into Micronesia, then into Polynesia. And those were those movements back in it, but it just took over time how all this happened, it was just, just, just blew me away and how this all could happen. And then, um, and then coming to, to, to Polynesia itself, um, when you look at this part of Polynesia and pretty much <laughs> sailed all in, the, all in amongst that, which is pretty amazing. It looks sort of, everything looks pretty close, but when you're on the ocean, it's, uh, wow, it's, it's huge. It's a big ocean, even though this is only part of the rest of the Pacific Ocean. You know, and that's just the that, that alone amazes me how our ancestors, how our people could could get to this point, and then all of a sudden to spread around in this central part of Polynesia, and then all of a sudden with the bat of an eyelid, they decided to go far east, far north, and then all of a sudden come down south, and that's that just sort of got my head spinning a bit, thinking, well. Why did, why did they come here and there and there? But they should they stick around in here. 
But it just got to that point where I figured out is that our ancestors became more explorers. They realized that they could, with what they had and what they, what they, the technology they had at that time and how they got around it, they got to that point where they can explore. And all of a sudden they just decided to branch in those three points of the triangle. And that, that alone, it's, it's an amazing feat on its own, you know, how they could get to do that. And it's all done by the waka, these voyaging canoes over time. The name waka is pretty much travels throughout all of Polynesia. Yeah, it's just, it's talked about. You know, and we just look at, and you, look, and you look at the, the different types of waka. You know, they talk about, wow, well, how these things, they from different sizes to, to, to the big ocean going walkers like you see back here. How they got to that, how, did, how, they, um, how, how, how they're so amazing, how they could end up building these, these amazing voyaging canoes to the point where they built into such a size where they could carry more people, more provisions, bigger sails, and they can sail faster across the ocean. And these, um, yeah, it's just amazing. Of course, they're double hull canoes, or we call them wakahaurua, you know, how they built the first, the outrigger, and then the double hull voyager canoe, which, which they used to, to, to travel across the ocean. And um, just, just amazing how these, these things could, could traverse the big ocean. Different styles of um, um, configurations of sails, but the double hull um, canoe style or the shape is pretty much all the same right through, the, through Polynesia. And over time, like I said, the, the canoes got bigger to the point where they started exploring. And to the point where they ended up sailing down here to, to Aotearoa. Coming down here to Aotearoa, not, you know, and then all of a sudden returning back up into the Polynesia, returning back to the islands. And that comes out to the stories. A good story is like a talk about is um, Kupe. Kupe came down on a waka, on his voyaging waka, on his voyaging waka called Matafaurua. Yeah? And then he went back. And then his nephew got the same waka, rehubbed it, and called it Natuki Matafaurua. His name was Nukutafiti. And he sailed that waka back down. You know, that's just one story. There's another story of my mum's waka, Tinana waka. Its proper name was, was Kurahopo. But it came back as Tinana. It came down as Kurahopo, went back, and then came down as Tinana. See, all these um, names of these um, ancestral wakas, everyone thought they, always came, they all came down one way. They're always all one way sailors, they just travel. But true to the renaming and where these wakas ended up arriving in the first time here in Aotearoa, and, and then they go back and then they arrive somewhere else around Aotearoa, these wakas were going backwards and forwards at that time. To a point where there was no need to voyage anymore because they realized Aotearoa was big enough, had enough resources at that time, and um, to a point where they, the, 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 the whole voyaging came to this sort of, wasn't an abrupt end, but just started to phase out because there was no need to travel back. And by then, things were people establishing themselves on, on Aotearoa, but the waka didn't change. The waka didn't stop there. The waka's changed, the, 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 the use of the waka's changed to now then, to then to um, what you call coastal waka's and to more traditional um, fighting waka's like these waka towers here. Still kept the voyaging past with the sails and having the outrigger, but then more coastal coastal single hull wakas going up and down the coast. And um, of course the wakatoa, the wakatete, the wakatangata, the wakatiwai were the type of wakas that, that were used around Aotearoa at that time. Then the voyaging canoe was never, never used after that. Oh, until, until 500, 600 years later, a whole bunch of Maori boys stunned on a waka and sailed off the Rarotonga on a voyaging canoe. It's sort of, yeah, it's a, it's a story on, a, on its own. But um, that's the wakas. And then, of course, the navigation side was, um, 
It was never used, never practiced, because there was no need to use that again. So I wouldn't say it got lost, it just got pushed, put to the side. It all became stories, it all became papa. it all became wayata, it, it, became, it became haka, it became whakairo or carvings. The information of voyaging was still there, but it was put, put like stored in, a, in its own way, so that all, it wasn't lost, but was never, never came around using it again until. Um, in 1976, a young guy by the name of Nainor Thompson met this amazing guy. His name is Mao Pialuk. Um, he's from an island called Setawa up in the, up in the Caroline Islands. His island is um, only six kilometers by six kilometers wide by 12 kilometers long. Very small island. The island is so small that when you visit his island, you only stay there for two hours. You do not stay any further. They don't want, because you can upset the way they live. It's so small. But the, the tradition um, of navigation is passed from um, grandfather to grand, to son, to son, to grandson. You know, it just gets traveled down. It's 2,000 years old, their navigation. They, they're this art that's been on this island. So Mao, um, I, got, I got to meet Mao back in 1980, 1985, when he was training this young Hawaiian navigator by the name of Nainor Thompson. And um, Mao, um, when they built Hokulea in 1976, Mao navigated that waka of Hokulea in 1976 from Hawaii to Tahiti. And the reason why they did that was they wanted to reconnect with their Tahitian. They knew they came from out of the, out of the south or out through, the, through French policy to, to Tahiti, but they didn't know how. So they built a waka called Hokulea, um, and they sailed it, and Mao navigated that waka from um, Hawaii to, um, to Tahiti in 1976. Alongside him, he had this young guy here by the name of Nainor Thompson. People asked Mao back then, Mao, how, do you, how did you navigate the canoe down to, um, to Tahiti? And you haven't, and, but you haven't sailed that ocean in your, in your whole life. You know, how do you know? And Mao would say, oh, from my grandfather. But how did your grandfather know? Oh, from his grandfather. But how does your grandfather from there Oh, from his grandfather. And, you know, that's how, we, that's how Ma would talk, you know. So he's, he was pretty much saying the knowledge was way back and it just got handed down. You know, even though I haven't sailed that part of the ocean, but I knew where Tahiti was when I left Hawaii. It was in the knowledge or it was in the, 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 the knowledge that I was taught from, from my great, 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 great grandfather down to me. So um, when he navigated that country in 19, uh, 1976, he reconnected Hawaii back to, uh, to Tahiti. And then from there, this young chap, Nainor Thompson, got involved and wanted to learn more about navigation. And so he became Mao's student. One thing about Mao, when he was on his island, when he was asked, his elders um, told him, you know, you mustn't take the knowledge from our island and give it out. But Mao could see that the Western society, the Western ways were coming onto his island, like the younger ones were more wanting to use outboard motors and, and not build little sailing canoes or fishing canoes. They rather use the, um, the outboard motor or the, the GPS and all that sort of thing. And he could see the knowledge was going to be lost. So he broke protocol, he broke tradition, and he came off the island and taught um, Nainor about voyaging. And then from there, we learned all about our voyaging through these two people. So the navigation side of things, I think you guys would, uh, would know what a star compass is. Have you seen a star compass before? Oh, boy. Yeah, this is a star compass, a couple of feet This is pretty much what Mao, what Mao taught us about a star compass, about a, a star compass. When he taught Nainor, <clears throat> and Nainor broke it down to, for us to understand, and then, then this is what we use to, to, to study and this is what we use on, on, on the waka, and this is what, how we use this on, on, on the ocean, on the voyaging canoes. So if you look at the star compass, just a quick runabout through the star compass, you've got your four cardinal points. 
We give them Māori names, give them the names, you know, Fiti, Fiti is, um, Fitinga is where the sun rises, and Tomokana is where the sun sets. Tomokana is like the door gets opened up, and the sun goes to sleep. So Tomokana. And Raki is, of course, the north, and Tonga, oh, everyone knows Tonga, it's always the south. Tonga is very, Tonga, the wind comes from the Tonga. And then we break the star compass up into what we call 32 points. And in between that, oh, I could press my this little button here. Yes. And in between these two points here, we call that a fare. There's seven fare to each quadrant. If you fold that quadrant over to that quadrant, the names are the same. They're given the names here, ra, ra, kainga, kainga. This is between that point and that point there is where the sun moves. Well, when we're, when we're navigating. Or tamanui, uh, tamanui te ra, yeah? And each one has ra, is opposite is ra. So in between those two points is, a, is we call it a fare. And that's where, the, where all what we use to navigate uh, reside in, or where they, where they live. And we give each one a, a house name, which is ra, we call it kainga, noi, manu, uh, ngarangi, ngareo, haka. And it mirrors right across so we don't get confused about it. And then um, each house, between each house, it's 11.25 degrees. Multiply that by 32, you get 360. Um, so for the, for the likes of the, of the sun, or Tamanui Tara, this is where he travels in between those two houses, Kainga and Kainga in the south of east, and Kainga in the north of east. And that sort of takes, yeah, that's where the sun moves through. Goes up here for its winter solstice and then comes down here for its summer solstice. So that's the star compass in the simplest I could give it to you guys. Can If you want to go a bit further, we can go a bit longer, but that'll, we'll go till next day. <laughs> we'll watch the sunrise in the morning. Um, but um, again, Matariki is in this house here. Oh, just... Oh, oh, what did I do here? Oh, here we go. Sorry. I pressed the wrong button. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Oh, here we go. I'll just clip, I'll just clip through these ones. Mm -hmm. So, um, so if we're going to lose the, uh, the, uh, so for the sun, Oh, Matariki's in here. This is Matariki's kainga, or this is Matariki's house. Stays in the house of kainga. Rises here and then sits over here. Which we are now in the middle of our Matariki, Matariki year, yeah? The sun goes up there at this time of the world, until the summer solstice and spends its time up there and it's on its way back, tracking its way back. So for a whole year, like from here to here, it takes three months for the sun to move to this house and it takes three months to come back and then three months down here, and then three months back, and it's pretty much our whole summer movement of the sun back to its equinox. So that's as simple as I can show you guys. Sorry, but before I come, I thought that you'd be looking at stars. You know, oh! Looking at the stars are, so I thought, in the sky, you look at the stars to find your way. That's yeah. what I thought, not looking at the sun. Oh, the sun is, the sun is one of our important ones. Because without the sun... Sun. Yes, we use the sun a lot, and also the stars. We use the stars, but the sun plays a big role for us, especially when we like this. When we're on the ocean, the star compass gets gets put on 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 the canoe. We mark it out on the canoe, yeah. and we use in the mornings. We use the sun to the sun rising in the morning and the sun setting in the evening, and that's just to give us that just that helps us with that direction. During the night time, we use the the stars to help us line us up a bit more to help us correct our course lines and stuff. But during the day, the sun plays a big role in the morning and in the evening, okay? And this is how we use all our tohus. The sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, and then we win wave, app, wave patterns, birds, and mammals. From here, the reason why the sun is up, because like I said, the sun is one of our main tohus that we use a lot. And we actually we read our weather, we can read all our movement of our winds, 
with the rising in the morning of the sun and also with the setting of the sun. And also you can help us with the likes of looking at the wave patterns that come across the ocean. But she, sometimes at nights when we don't get any cloud, we get a lot of cloud cover, we get 80% cloud cover. If we don't use the sun in the evening and watch where the swells are coming from using the sun, then that we, if we don't use that sun and getting a direction of where the swells are coming, we're going to find ourselves not staying on course too, too good. So that's why the sun is pretty much one of our most, during the morning and during the evening. But nighttime, we use those, um, the stars and of course the moon, and then of course planets, just the movement of the planets across the night sky. The wind plays a good role in the light. So sometimes we can't see any of these planets, stars, moon or sun, then we use the wind and then we use the wave. We're gonna, sometimes we can actually sail our canoe by just using wave patterns or wave movements, how the waka rides across the ocean. And I've been on voyages with Mao, the, the navigator. He, I've seen him navigate. He talk about the stories about navigators can navigate the canoe inside the hulls. I've been on a voyage where he's actually navigated the canoe inside the hull, just by the movement of the canoe. And that's amazing. That's very hard even today. We struggle to learn those movements because the canoe moves in a certain pattern. But when we were with Mao, Mao could read it. Mao could read 45 types of wave patterns on the ocean. I only can understand three. He knows the different types of movements of the waves and how the wind blows the waves. He knows how. So that's just, a, just amazing. That's just amazing how he could do that on the ocean. And then the likes of the birds and the mammals is more like looking for land. Start looking for your islands and stuff like that. Down here in um, Aotearoa, Mahutonga, the Southern Cross plays a big role for us here in Aotearoa. We use Mahutonga to help us sail up into the tropics and also to help us sail back down here in, to Aotearoa. And of course, you know, you know all the, you know the two pointers and oh, Jesus. Yeah, the Southern Cross and all that. And of course, this is what I teach a lot of my young students or my kids how to use the Southern Cross, um, where to find the Southern Cross at night, how the Southern Cross moves across the night sky, um, how you use it to help you with a way of uh, direction. And pretty much it just helps us um, give us a, a direction of where south is because it goes around, you know, it rotates around the south celestial pole. And then um, when we look, if you can find the Southern Cross, we sort of get an idea where, where north is and there's also indicators or stars that we use, and the other two stars that we use is what we call the capella pointers. Yeah, they at a certain point, you see the capella pointers are good indicators with North Star is or with Polaris. Is. Um, and then of course, uh, Matariki, um, it plays that role also, um, and the likes of helps us, um, just helps us with the likes when you see Matariki rise, and we see Matariki rising off the horizon line, we can know that it comes out of the house of Kainga, or where we wanted to sail, or if you're sailing into us to, towards Rorotonga, we use Matariki just to help us line us to where the Cook Island chain. We don't target just one island, we target what we call the expanded landform or the Cook Island chain of islands. And Matariki has that pattern that it pretty much crosses across and we use it in the, when it's rising and we use it when it's setting. But Matariki plays, you know, here in Aotearoa, well Matariki is our, our, our Māori New Year cluster of stars. Um, when I grew up, we, only, we never celebrated Matariki, but, because, but we knew what, what Matariki was all about. Um, at that time, all we knew about Matariki when I was growing up, it was a good time to prepare the land, harvest what you got, prepare that for winter, and get the land ready to plant for the next winter, for the next summer, or before the next, ready for season. That's what Matariki was back in, when I grew up. Um, now these days, you, it's all about the different stars or the, the, the nine stars within Matariki itself. Um, so we, we, we now celebrate it in that way, but I still celebrate it my way that Matariki is just that time when I know when we was growing up that was a time of, our, of everything was at its, at, at its best or at its harvest time and prepping the land for, for prepping for the next planting season. And especially when you go out to the ocean, knowing that things at that time are in good, good condition, and then at the time we harvest at that time. So um, just, a, just a way to how to find Matariki at night, a lot of you would 
pretty much would know where it is. Um, this is Puanga. You first know the name Puanga, eh? Rajul? Kapai. Yep. 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 Toturu is uh, Ryan's belt. To, you first know Tomata Kuku? Oh, that right. Tomata Kuku is uh, Doris? Yeah, Doris. Yeah, and then Matariki. Yep. So this is how you find it. Just find um, Toturu and then go up to Tom Tomata Kuku and you'll find Matariki. On the West Coast, a lot of the whanau celebrate Puhanga a lot. Especially up in the, up down the line there, they don't see Matariki as much, but they see Puhanga. So Puhanga is celebrated at the same time. This is our star compass up in the far north at a little place called Odiri, um, where Hector's uh, Busby's uh, property is. This is where we did a lot of our, um, our studies when we were studying the, 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 the ocean and studying stars and, and rising of stars and setting of stars and also the sun and the moon and the movements. This is where we spent a lot of our time over the years Right through the winter times, uh, just sitting there studying, getting up in the mornings and watching, or during the nights and spending our time out on the star compass up at Hector's property. So, when you do all the navigating and you're navigating around the ocean, along the ocean here, there's three things we learn about when you're navigating. First things foremost, we've got to learn about when, you, when we're navigating, um, we've got three things we learn about and we've got to study about. One is knowing where you're from point A to point B. You've got to know the distance you're traveling. You've got to know the, the second thing, you've got to know the speed of your canoe, how fast you're traveling over a, of a sunrise or a sunset. And you've got to know how, how long or you've got to give an idea of how long you're going to be on the ocean. Those are the three things we spend a lot studying about. And in between that, we study all our stars or we prep ourselves for the, for the voyage and stuff like that. But once you're on the ocean and we're getting close to landform, we start looking for signs of the land. And um, the first one that we start looking for are the birds. And with the birds, we look at certain birds. We don't study um, land birds. We study more ocean-going birds, birds that live on the ocean, during pretty much all their lives, but in certain times of the of of the month, they breed, and they breed on, on on the islands. And either one of the parents is sitting on the nest, and the other parent is flying out every morning and heading back every evening out to feed or to collect food for the young. Every bird, the birds that we use, have certain distance of flight. Um, some about thirty nautical miles, forty nautical miles, up to sixty nautical miles. The birds need the sun to fly out. In the morning, and the birds need the sun to fly back in the evening. They mustn't stay out. The, 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 the adults or the one adult mustn't stay and sleep on the ocean during the night. It has to fly back in the evening. And sometimes we see them on the ocean, and we think, oh, no, but just before the sun sets, they, sh they fly up, and then, they, and then they fly straight. They fly straight to where land is. And this is where we um, use them to navigate. If we're inside the range of... Um, a bird's fly pipe, if we're sailing in here, and that bird flies out in the morning, flies past our canoe, flies onwards, and then all of a sudden in the evening it's flying straight back. We know just by the, the type of bird it is, um, we know its flight or its range of flight. If we're sailing, if it's a 30 nautical mile range or 50 nautical mile range, if it flies past it, it flies past us, going back, we know we're in its flight range. So we must probably either 30 or 50 nautical miles inside its range of coming back into the island. And it's uh, pretty, and this is knowing the types of birds um, to, to, to look for. Um, it's, and there's, um, we look for a little, there's a little white tern, a little white tern that, that lives on the ocean, but they, they, they live there during the day as partners. They live out on the ocean, but certain times um, they, they go back to breeding. There's the other type of bird, which is called a frigate bird. Um, we use these other birds called a, um, they're more like tropical birds. There's a bird called the um, called Amukura. It's a bird called the Amukura. It's got a long tail on it. We call it a navigation bird. And this one here, that one right there. This bird here, that bird there, and this one here. Those pretty much are our types of navigation birds we use. Um, this is the old frigate bird. This bird here is a bit of a... If you ever heard know about a frigate bird, it's, it's, a, it's a bird that we call it the thief. 
he flies when these guys fly out to fish. And he flies close to where these guys are. And during the evenings, when they're flying back, he hangs out there and he attacks these ones when they carry him. And they, they throw up all their food and he takes it off them. So this bird here is a, he's also a navigator bird, but he's a bit of a thief. And this bird here, when we're leaving an island, if this bird comes in off the ocean and it's flying really low over the islands or over the, over the trees, over the coconut trees, he's only coming in because it's a storm. So we don't go out, we don't sail if the frigate bird comes in inland. And then the gannet or the booby bird, we see this one a lot because it's out further out and it's, it's, go, it's a long distance fisher. Goes out fishing long distance. So we use them a lot. But these, pretty much these three other the sort of birds that we use to um, um, find land. And then the likes of our mammals, the whales, um, especially up in, um, in the tropics, a lot of the whales are, are resting after their long travel and they don't actually, um, they don't actually reach the islands. They pretty much know they're close to the island. You just see them frolicking around. And we pretty much come across the likes of the, um, the cows and the calves. They're pretty well resting a lot and they always rest in your island groups in that long journey. Um, our ancestors, um, the currents, the ocean going currents, especially the current from, um, from Aotearoa through to the Kermitix, through to the Kermitix, um, you see these whales migrating through the currents. And the, the calves and the, the cows and the calves use those currents because of the, the young, they, they can um, suckle the young, the young can suckle off the cow, off the, off the, the, the cow as it's traveling in the current. So these, these travel the currents all the time. And we've been on the ocean where we actually encounter the, this is where they see the big ocean going, um, the ocean uh, killer whales. They know where all these ones are traveling during the times of the years when they're traveling through the, through the, through the ocean. And they sit around these currents. And they, this is where they harvest, this is where they uh, um, attack a lot of the cows and the, the calves for their young because this is, they, they know where all these things are migrating through, through the, through the big canyons and stuff and through the currents. And we came across one in uh, our, our recent voyage where we, we came across where the, a big pot of killer whales, orcas had gone and um, taken a, a right whale, our mother's calf. And they're just, yeah, you know, horrible thing, but it's just the way nature is. And as we get closer to the islands and the, uh, the bird life gets more and more and because of the fish, and then, and then you all of a sudden see the, the islands or the, or the coconut trees and stuff like that. Another thing I've seen over the last, the voyages I've gone is um, 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 reflection. It's where the sun shines through clouds and reflects the color of the island up into the, up into the um, clouds. Yeah, color reflection, which is pretty, pretty amazing if you ever get to see, opportunity to see that. And over the times we've voyaged, we've seen it a few times. Um, this is Tapu Tapu Atea or Atea. This is where um, our our traditional, our ancient, or our traditional wakas uh, would have departed from. Um, this is a very sacred spot up in uh, up in up in Tahiti, up in the islands. Um, this is a place where all our, especially from here for Alte, this is where we connect ourselves back into from Alte or back to these these special places in uh, in Tapu Tapu Atea or Rai Atea or Huihine. Um, this is where our our master, our ancient, um, our traditional wakas would have left from, left from, but then spread out through the, through the, the lower island groups. So 2012, recently, 2012, um, we set sail um, on a voyage to Easter Island. Um, we took Te Aurere Waka, which is this one I skip it, and then we had another small, um, had another voyaging canoe that Hector built, um, Nahida Kamai Tofiti, and we set sail to Easter Island. We left in... Uh, yeah, we left in, uh, in, uh, in August, and um, it took us um, 108 days to get to Easter Island. And we had three stops on the way. We stopped in 43 days. We sailed from Auckland to the island of Tupuai, which is in the Astral Islands. Um, we took us 43 days here. We stayed here one week in Tupuai. Um, and then a week later, we left and we headed off to another island. The story, this amazing story about us 
um, sailing from um, from Auckland, from Auckland to this island of Tupuai in the Astrals. Um, we, we arrived there 43 days later um, and we heard about a story about um, one of their elders had passed away um, two weeks prior to our arrival. And one of the elders there was telling us about the elder that passed away um, five years. The elder, the elder that died five years, um, he had a vision of two voyaging canoes arriving to his island. Two weeks before we arrived, he passed away. So when we arrived here on this island of Tupuai, we were, us crew were 43 days and, and the island was pretty much, pretty much the, the whole island was pretty much crying and we couldn't figure out why they were so crying so much. It's because they, the, the vision of their elder of five years visioning two voyaging canoes arriving from the south onto his island and then two weeks prior to our arrival, he passes away. And that's why they were, they were so feeling so unemotional. And then, of course, of our arrival, this, they just sealed that, that vision of their, their elder back, back then. So it was pretty special, um, this island of Tupuai. Around this island here in Tupuai, we came across marais, these ancient marais. And these ancient marais are marais that they talk about voyaging canoes arriving to these islands. And there's an arm, um, there's a marae, and their marae's are not like our marae's here in Aotearoa. Their marae's are just like a big square load of rocks, but they had all these layers of rocks. And one, one marae there with a stone in the middle was Aotea, the marae of Aotea. So that was pretty special to us. We went and, we went and gave a, planted a mango tree next into the, into where the marae was. But all these marae's all connect back through all the islands through, the, through Polynesia. So this island of Tupua is uh, was a special, special, special island, um, and it just yeah, just us arriving there was pretty, pretty amazing. And the last time they said they were, the, the stories talked, they never had a voyaging, two voyaging canoes arrive. You know, the last time they ever talk about voyaging canoes is when they left, left the island a long, long time ago. So one week later, <coughs> we stayed one week there, and then. Um, we left Tupuai and we headed off to the next island group, to this place called Mangareva, another beautiful island um, in, the, in the Tuamotus. Um, the closest island to this one is uh, Muriroa Atoll, which is only 200 nautical miles um, from this island. And um, another story is that we were tacking up towards Mangareva and we had gone past Mangareva, but we needed to tack because the wind was blowing us in that direction. We ended up sailing within the 200, or actually the 100 mile zone of uh, Muruwai, and then we got, radio, we got radioed up to, to turn around and sail out. We were pretty much encroaching on that island of Muruwai. And um, you know, you guys all know about Muruwai at all, how, me, how, how they blew the hell out of that island. Um, but Mangareva Island is, um, is one island where a lot of their, their ancient, ancient navigators lived. And these are navigators that were way before uh, Kupe. Kupe wasn't born, and they were talking about navigators that we asked about Kupe, because oh, no, Kupe was, was only in the cosmos, that's how they would say it. He was only a star. But they had navigators that were living on this, or moving around these islands that were way before Kupe. We stayed on Mangareva again for one week, and we were prepping for our next, which our next challenge was to navigate the, 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 the canoes to, um, to Easter Island. Um, when we left Auckland in, in, in August 17th, we had a young guy, his name was Peter P. Smith, and he was training, myself and Jack were training him to become a, master, uh, a navigator. So he was navigating these, le these different legs, and we were teaching him. And his, to pass his... Um, to pass his um, test or to pass his graduation to, to becoming a master navigator, he had to navigate the canoe from Mangareva to Easter Island, traditionally. So a week later we left Rap, uh, East, uh, Mangareva for Rapa Nui and we left in the evening and I just want to give you a bit of an idea. We left in sunset. Okay, we left in sunset. 
The next shot is Pitkin Island. There's sunrise. Pitkin Island. You fellas all know about Pitkin Island, eh? You know the stories about you know the story about Pitkin Island. You know about the bounty. Yeah, good. My kids go, oh, we don't know about the bounty, Matua. Oh, you better learn about the bounty, you know. But it was amazing. We sailed past that island, and we got to talk to the kids through our, through our, through our laptops and stuff we had on board, and it was great. Our kids, had, the kids on this island were tracking us from Auckland. That's how amazing technology was. But, um, yeah, so sunrise. And on our way down to... Uh, to Rapa Nui, we caught, we caught uh, a lot of fish. Um, but we noticed over the voyages we've done, over the voyages we've done over the time, we noticed that the fishing is not as good as what it used to be 20 years ago. Um, we weren't catching, we weren't catching as what we used to catch, you know. And um, that's a pretty, pretty, pretty freaky when you're sort of, you know, we're catching fish like. We used to catch fish about maybe once every day, but in this forge, we're catching them maybe once every four days. And I was like, "Whoa, well, crazy. And you usually catch them in the mornings or in the evenings, but we weren't getting as fish. So when we did catch fish, we, you know, we, we treasured it a lot and we um, enjoyed it. Um, but then, um, yeah, that's the, that's the saddest thing. And then 22 days later, we reach it up and we, there's sunrise. So 22 days, we were pretty much, with the stars and everything else, we were pretty much sailing on that movement of the sun. Our young navigator that was navigating the canoe, he was navigating, but pretty much he done a great job. We were supposed to, we were supposed to, by right, we were supposed to sail way, way down, way past Rapa Nui, way past Easter Island, and then come back up. But what happens, we sailed in, um, we sailed in this sort of, we sailed like this, this is Mangarewa up here, there's Easter Island over there. We were supposed to sail down here, and then along, and then up. But no, we sailed like this. Did the curve sail. That was just perfect. Um, that was one of our, to me, I've voyaged a lot. That was one of our most perfect sails, perfect navigating sails we ever done. And to find Easter Island, it only has to cover itself with cloud and you'll sail right past it. You'll miss it. You might as well carry on all the way to, all the way to Chile because that, that island is like, it is small. And have you been to Easter Island? Yeah, I just like, it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's so small. You just, you'd be amazed how this, and you'd be amazed how our ancestors navigated the, their canoes to this island. It is like barest island you could ever come across. And you can see why over the, over the history and, and what happened on the island, but it is, it, it is a very um, small island, and it's a very, um, it's an amazing island. Um, the Rapa Nui people um, there, um, they pretty much speak Māori. That's, that's, that's the amazing thing about it. We could, we could have our, our mihi in Māori, we could speak in Māori, they could speak back to us in Māori. The only thing that's a little bit twisted is because they're, they're, they're mixed in with the Chilean um, thing, but pretty much the culture, the way they do things are similar, pretty much similar. And that, that, that alone was amazing on its own, that we got to... Um, to, to arrive here and, and to, to Easter Island and end up just sat there and had a conversation. Um, we are, we are, are sailed in one week too early. So we couldn't, they couldn't, <laughs> they couldn't welcome us on. So we pretty much had to stay on the canoes for one week <laughs> offshore for a whole week watching them prepare because we had arrived too early. And then of course the main person who was Hector, he wasn't flying in until after the week, so we sat on our walkers for one whole week, uh, just bobbing around, and we we had to shift around the island a lot because we couldn't anchor. There's no there's no sheltered spot. Rapa Nui cannot shelter. 
you got to keep no shooting because the wind moves around all the time. So you can't stay for long. So we were staying in one night and then we had to move around because the wind picked up and we had to go around and pretty much go around and around the island. Yeah, until, until a week later when we, we, we arrived, we were told to come back onto the island. Yeah, just um, just amazing, amazing how you can see how this, 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 this culture, how this tribe, how these people um, built these amazing moai and how they would, and, and the thing about the moai that we noticed is that all the moai are all looking inland um, and they're different sizes. These are the big, big ones. There were some, some, some ones bigger than that and two little tiny little ones about the size of my, my son there. Look. Um, and they were little small moai, but they were moai all over the island. They only came out of one quarry. So these things were moved around. They, they shifted these things around. And you can see why the island lost a lot of its vegetation because these things have been moved around, um, around the island. So a lot of the Moai were looking inland, bar from five, to the southern end of Easter Island. I never have a photo of it, but there's, to the southern end of Easter Island, there are five Moai that are looking out to sea. Um, we, were, we went to visit and we asked why, and they asked us because they're looking south to where the, to where the people come from, where, 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 where their ancestors come from. And we, um, we had the, uh, the map of Rapa Nui, the southern end of Rapa Nui, and we drew a straight line. And that straight line went straight to Chatham Islands, direct. These five Moai were looking in that one direction, and that just like pretty much blew us out of the water. We just, what, what's, what's funny, about, what's the connection with that? And then some of the drawings we saw in Rapa Nui are the similar drawings to uh, on, uh, on Chatham Islands, I have the same shape drawings of the Moriori. So that's another story. That's another um, journey that, you know, that people <laughs> can have a journey on that, just finding that out at land. Um, you can see where the Moai are all looking inland. That's the quarry where they get dug out of. And um, all up in that, that part of Rapa Nui, all around there, is all moai, half dug out of the ground. Some are broken, like some of the moai, they must have just dug it out, of the, um, carved it out of the ground, dragged it down and they broke it, and then they just left it and gone back up and did another one. It's like just got broken yesterday. That's how amazing this place around here. And this is the only place um, that they quarry or that they made the, the moai out of. Um, the hats alone, those big hats alone, they're all made out of scoria. They took it around from the volcanoes and they bring those around and they, those are the hats they go on top of the moai. That's, that's just, just, yeah, pretty amazing. Um, we used to think, we had a, went up with one of the ladies and she told us how they would dig the, the moai out. They'll find a nice flat rock. They'll cut the shape of the moai out and then they'll cave underneath. And then they, due to the sheer weight, they actually can snap the, 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 the moai off, off the base of the, the rock and it will stand itself up and then they just slide it down the hill. There's big trenches further around um, that we visited that where they would drag these moai down, down the hill. That's how, how amazing the place was. So, um, yeah, this is our, our voyage in uh, 2012. And um, this is th 43 days here to Tupuai. This is the white line is our rum line. The red line is Odere and the green line is Nahiraka. And you can see how we curved our way and took us 43 days, which is the longest voyage any of us had done in our lifetime. Um, then from here to Mangareva. And then you can see our trip down to Easter Island to here. Like I said, we were supposed to go down here and then come along and then go back up, but we just stayed here. The weather kept us in this line all the way to Rapa Nui. And then 37 days back to Morea, and then Morea to Rarotonga, and then Rarotonga to Aotearoa via the Kermadex. So that took, um, left in two, uh, it took about 10 and a half months round trip um, to sail that whole trip to Easter Island and back. And then completed our whole voyage with Odere um, all the way to Hawaii in 1995. Rotonga in 92, 1995 to Hawaii and back, 
and then to Easter Island back. So we did all that voyage um, of the Pacific, uh, of, the, of the Polynesian Triangle, on those three points um, in the Pacific, in the Triangle. Yeah, and in August 2017, we arrived back in, um, here in um, Aotearoa, yeah, in May 2013. Did that long, long time at, at, uh, away, the countries arrived. Um, pay a lot of my, 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 my respect, my honour to this, 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 this uncle of mine, Hector Busby. Um, yep, yeah, he was, um, he was, um, he was a bridge builder, of course. Built a lot of bridges in his lifetime. Um, left school when he was um, when he was only standard four. Um, worked in the bread thing and then ended up working the bread in Kaitaia bread factory in Kaitaia bakery. And then he decided to work for um, um, Ministry of Works. And then he ended up learning the, the way how they built bridges and to the point where he ended up making his own business of bridge building. He's built up about 200 bridges all over the far north. Um, over his lifetime, and then from then, in 1985, when Hokulea came down to um, um, Aotearoa in 1985, um, an elder of ours, Sir James Henry, um, put a, a challenge to him, said to him, you need to build a, a Voyager canoe and return the favour of the Hawaiians, of them coming down here and giving the knowledge, or sharing the knowledge, you need to build a Voyager canoe and sail back to Hawaii. And we did that in 1995 on Te Waka. We sailed Te Arere Waka back to Hawaii to pay that uh, thing. And then, of course, now we finished the Easter Island trip um, on Oudere again. But in his lifetime, Hector, from building, can uh, from building bridges, he built a lot of canoes, uh, two Voyager canoes and a lot of wakas, um, paddling wakas. Um, war canoes and, and traditional wakas are for different people. And he's also built 10 paddling canoes, traditional wakas up in Hawaii. And over his time, he's built so many, so many, and he's, he's connected up, he's connected a lot of people. So from being a bridge builder as a profession, as his business, he actually became a bridge builder and re-bridge, building the bridges into the Pacific through waka. Um, I just had the privilege to spend that amazing time with them. And at that time, in the beginning, it was just myself and Hector. We were the only two back in 1985 that were voyaging with the Hawaiians back then. And then over the, over the years, our voyaging whānau had grown, grown to now we have, um, we have uh, four, well, we used to be five of us, five uh, master navigators in Aotearoa here, um, Jack Thatcher, um, Piripi Smith, uh, Piripi Evans, Hector and myself. Um, but two had passed away, Hector and Piripi Evans. So yeah, it's just, just three of us now that are master navigators, but we're in the process of, of, of graduating our, some of our students to become master navigators. So which is pretty cool. But yeah, it was Hector that started all, all it, done it all his way. And, um, and yeah, it's just been an amazing journey that I've, and the privilege to be with him and grow up and having uh, being there with him and building, going through that journey of, with, with our wakas. And of course, yep, this, this amazing elder of mine is um, Sir James Henare. And um, this quote, he said this in 1985 when the Hawaiians arrived here at Waitangi. And this is what he said when he, when he um, stood up and he, he said this and he was just amazed. He, 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 he was just had a had he had a smile on his face all night, you know that he just just couldn't believe it that we had done. He just like yeah, you guys have did it, you have done it, and you in here. And um, myself growing up with these these elders around me, it was one of the most amazing privileges that I had. Which you know I wish other young ones um, back in those days, you know, we never had, like today, you know, young ones, our young Māori leaders don't have this opportunity, but I, I had the great opportunity to grow up these, um, with these amazing elders, with uh, Sir James Henare, um, um, with, um, with uh, Hector, um, with uh, John Rangiho, all those amazing kaumātuas, of course with my dad and stuff, 
And just growing up with them around me, um, I was, 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 was just having them around was amazing and listening and, and taking a lot of their, 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 what they taught me through to the journey of, of voyaging and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. That's what it's all about. I could go on all night, but, yeah. But, um, yeah. We'll take some questions, if anyone has questions. We'll take questions from the audience. Yeah. If there's any online ones, so, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah it's wonderful. Um, so there was a, uh, there was seven fiberglass walker built. Um, I came across the first one that was moored at Whakatane, and I was just walking along the foreshore and got torn to the chaps on board, I thought it was a pretty amazing looking vessel. Um, and they told me about that project to build the seven, that there was the first one we um, So I invited them to come up here, you know, um, because we had a planetarium uh, at that stage. I can't remember the year it was, but you probably have a better idea. My kids are a little, so that tells me they're sort of 35 yeah, now. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, so now they had a... a, a, a a guy from Tahiti who was um, an expert on Polynesian navigation. And so the Stardome hosted them, all the crews, and yep. in, in the Stardome here, and he was able to use the Stardome night sky to show them what the, the sky would look like if they're heading to different islands. Mm. And uh, so each crew was, had to learn the uh, thing. Now, the thing that he said is that they fixed their latitude by the simultaneous rising and setting of two stars. Two stars, yeah. And that's the first meridians. time I'd ever heard of that. Yeah. So yeah. that's, mm. is that common? Yeah, you call them meridians. Yeah. Two stars rising side by side off the horizon line and two stars rising one above the other. Yeah. So we would memorize um, 60, 60 meridian pairs. Yeah, and that's 360. So the meridians are just just studying which house there are and then working out the meridians that rise within those houses. He was using it to fix the latitude. Latitude, yeah. Yeah, so basically uh, if there's only, uh, and so each island had its pair of stars. Yeah. Um, and then subsequently I was talking to a friend of mine who was uh, the partner of a, an am a very keen amateur astronomer and she was talking about this and she said as, she was Maori and she said as children they had to learn these Rhymes, a bit like a ring a ring a ring, yeah. sort of rhymes that had no meaning really today, but they were just things that they had already been taught. Yeah. And these were all sorts of pairs of things. And uh, she was wondering or speculating whether those pairs, long since forgotten by the Maori, mm -hmm. were the ancestral names or the stars that mm -hmm. fixed those islands in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. I think you've got to think about, about understanding, you know, Polynesians arrived here first, they. You know, so that, that that knowledge of voyaging was through Polynesia, eh? you know, and, and all of a sudden, and then of course, well, Maori, this, uh, but that, but that, and I, I, you know, that, that's right. I mean, they, that, that's also a lot of, of chance and storytelling where, and it's interesting, I, I had the opportunity when I came down here, when I sailed in 85, and I arrived here, and I, and, and I sat with these, <laughs> it was funny, it was my dad and Sir James and, Sir John Rangiho, and, and I, I was like a, they were like little kids, sit, you know, you're, you're sitting in amongst prominent people of Aotearoa, Māori prominent kaumātua, and what I had to do was to sit there, and it was my first voyage in 19, and they wanted to know what I saw in the night sky, and they said, what did you see? And I, well, back then I was, I was only going by the, by the Greek names, you know, that I was taught, and, I, and they says, oh, what did you look at? And I said, well, come outside and I'll show you. And no, we're, the good thing about at Titi Marae, it was, was quite nice. There weren't big lights back in those days. And, I, and by, light, by night, the, 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 the night was out. And all the Hawaiians had gone home, but I had to sit up all night with these old fellows. And, and I was pointing out where Ryan was, and I was showing them Taurus, and they're like, oh. and, they're, and then they, they, they sit around and they started rattling off a chant. They were starting to do their whakapa, and they were chanting about you know, Tauturu and Puhanga, and, and I was going, what? What, 
of those names. And they go, that's the Greek name. He goes, oh boy, we, you're just telling us, you know, and they said, did you see us? Yeah, every night now. I was just pointing at all these different stars and I, and I pointed at um, the Capella pointers. And at that time, the, both of them were coming up like this. And I said, oh, if you see those two stars going up this angle, you should run the line down there and you can find north. And they go, hey. And I go, yeah. And they go, how do you know? I said, well, that's what I said for 16 days on the earth. I've been looking at this all night. And, um, but they were going through stuff that, what I was saying when I was showing them, the night, it was igniting all this fucker papa stuff that was, they'd been talking about all their, all their lives. They were taught from there, you know? And I just think, wow, one day, We'll end up using that one day, you know, we'll end up, and sure enough, today we, we, we do it, you know, we, and I was telling the, my mates about it, and I goes, man, that was way back then, and I said, it was just a, and then, and like you just said about the lady talking about the, you know, there were like nursery rhymes, but these were those things that they were taught as kids, you know, and that's, 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 that's pretty, and then, and then from then we figured out, oh, these are the things that could have been, the, and then over time was the latitudes we were working out, over time when, um, if you've got to meet Jack Thatcher, um, he was another one, we, you know, I know another our pony navigators that we work through our latitudes and stuff, because that's what we do out on the ocean, we learn a lot about our latitude, where we are on the ocean, I mean, the longitude, well, that's pretty, pretty, you know, you know it's, as long as you, you know, know the, the, the Southern Cross, but as we get further into the Northern Hemisphere, then you see the North Star, well, pretty much, eh? Um, so, for example, if we if we navigating like when we went up to Hawaii in 1985, when Jack and Pitipi were navigating then, um, to get Hawaii's latitude was Hawaii's laid at 21 degrees, you know, and then what we did we just measured up five degrees of uh, Polaris, the North Star, five degrees above the horizon, five degrees the Southern Cross as it stands straight up five degrees of the horizon, we're at the latitude of Hawaii, so we knew where to turn. But when we're sailing the canoes. We always make sure that we try and stay on the eastern side of the islands. We try not to sail west. So when we just, when we do our course lines, we always allow for a lot of hard heading east as much as we can, or northeast, to stay way above. And then when we find our latitude direction, then we can sail down. Um, once I made, we made a, a bit of a boo where we sailed too far west. And we just spent days and days and days just tacking, tacking, tacking back up, which the canoes don't like doing. You know, they're horrible things to tack. But um, but the cool thing about up in the northern hemisphere, we get a lot of the good trade winds, which that's what makes it easy when you're navigating up from uh, Tahiti or or through Tahiti up towards the Marquesas and up to Hawaii, you get the good trade winds, which are really good. And the only things you hit is the doldrums and the stuff like that. But pretty much the trade winds are they're pretty much constant. The only thing will stuff a trade went up is either a volcano or whatever that's happening. But yeah, that was that, those, those are good times. I mean, but our one down to Easter Island, well, we weren't supposed to be there. We actually weren't weren't supposed to be. But what happens is that back then, um, New York had that big cyclone go through New York, cut across, and that big cyclone was so big it pushed the weather systems towards us, our favour. And then we had a big system down here, and we just had this narrow corridor that we got stuck in. Yeah, we weren't supposed to, we were supposed to go all the way down to 39, pretty much on the edge of the roaring 40s to cut back. That was the talk, that's what, what we planned to do. But we got stuck in this corridor where we ended up just staying in this amazing corridor, but just thanks to those two big systems um, that we, we, we encountered then. But yeah, the navigation was good was good navigating, good night skies. Very rare, very rare we would navigate with that sort of night sky. I think we had about 50 to about 60% of good, good, good night sky, which was good. Had the good, had the good main points to start that we needed. Yeah, it was pretty good. Um, the ocean, yeah, it's been years, I mean, 2012, um, just noticed that over the years, um, the ocean is just, yeah, it's, just, it's not looking good. The weather systems are different now. We're getting more frequent odd weather and uh, the weather's, you know, especially down here, it's, it's a bit more more violent. Um, I know we sailed up and we get, you know, you get, a, get a, you get a bit of a hammering on the way up, 
But lately, it's just, yeah, you get a, yeah, you're pretty. And you can't read it in a way. Sometimes you struggle to read that weather because it's just, just the way things are with, the, with what's happening in the, in the, in the, in the Pacific. But um, notice there's just a lot more um, traffic in the ocean now and fishing boats and, oh, it's just like, it's, it's everybody's at the moment. Um, and what we're sailing in, is, it's, it's um, every island's got its exclusion zone, but in between each exclusion zone, it's that there's gaps of ocean that are international, that's where all the fishing vessels are sitting in. Um, you get closer to the equator, it's like Auckland, motorway. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Because there's no, there's no exclusion zone, so it's just sitting there. It's just like, just looking up like Christmas trees. And that's the saddest bit. And I've seen that, yeah, it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. And there's no control. Yeah, that's, that's the scary bit. There's no control of it. Wild west oh. oh, it's Wild West. It's pretty much. I have a question. Yeah. I think you'd stand this at this talk. I just, in your travels through the islands, yeah. have, you, have you seen and experienced the same sort of renaissance and ocean going navigation in the, in the other islands? And you talked about uh, coming back from Hawaii and then out of Aotearoa. Is there back, a appetite for oh, that? Back in the early days, it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't really much. I think it. Um, over the recent, just the recent years, the, 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 the smaller island groups of, like the main groups of like Tahiti and Rarotonga and, uh, and, um, and um, like Tonga or Samoa, um, and, New, and they, they, they've told it started, but way back in then, they, they weren't even practicing it. Yeah, that's only, only if you went further up into the, um, up into Melanesia and up into that area, but through the, down this end, this wasn't, wasn't practiced. Yeah, um, over the over the times I've voiced, but now, oh now, yeah, pretty much now you can see the big movement, and a lot of it now is more like, um, Pishi and Tahiti, in the Tuamotus, a lot of the island groups now are finding out the ancient leo, the ancient language, and then that ancient language has got a lot of a lot of fucka papa navigation stuff, but. Yeah, and that's that's interesting. When we went there, a lot of them were talking about, and it was it was due to our arrival that they realised that wow, you guys are still you are practicing this, and now they've gone back and they like a lot of them are finding their own sites, and they're coming across a lot of stuff that um, that hadn't been used or practiced. Um, but then there's a lot of islands, small island groups that they pretty much just wiped. Yeah, which is sad. Um, but they, they, they're slowly getting back to finding the, the ancient real, the language that they use, and, it's, and I'll be honest with you, it's, it's, it's like Māori, the ancient language, yeah. And the islands we went to, and interesting enough, the island we went to in Mangareva, there's a small island off Mangareva, it's in part of the Mangareva island, and this place we went to, interesting enough, the name of the little area is called Auriri. And if you Google the name up, it's right there, this little bay called Odity. And I was talking to the co-marchers there, and they said, you know, and they, he showed us this old marae. He says, this is where they, and they, and they, and they started reciting stuff in, in Te Reo Māori. And they talked about these, and this is where they talked about these ancient navigators way before, they're like, oh, we talk about kupe, but he goes, oh, kupe, nah, not kupe. This follows like um, one, one known tiro, Great navigator called Tiro, and I said, oh, oh no, that was our great ancient navigator, you know? And when they, um, and then they talk about how these, these ancient navigators would traverse through their, their, their islands, through the, that central pass, and they would always picking up and dropping off, picking up and dropping off. And we said, oh, that means, you know, they must go back to Rayatea, you know, this place where our ancestors goes, what? No, this, Right here is all, in pretty much in all the islands. So, you know, that's how far the, the, the stories go back. But, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, it's coming back. I mean, they, they got, they're hoping to get in schools. We've got two guys in the Cook Islands that are relearning the, the voyaging and uh, like this, one of those seven wakas called Maru Maru Atua. They're up there doing a lot of mahi with, with, their, with their rangatai. And, but yeah, the, the groups are starting to get back to, to navigation, which is cool. Yeah, that's really, yeah, it's, it's a long time. But then there's some that pretty much lost it all, like never practiced today. 
which is which is pretty, but it's it's okay. We you know we they, we we share it all around um, with, with them. Yeah. We've got any more questions from the floor? <laughs> yeah, I've got one. Um, so in, in terms of the Pūrāko around Māori astronomy, because presumably you, when you were first started sailing in 85, you mm. probably didn't have any, because navigation across the Pacific has, is reviving all those Pūrāko around mm. the Fitu, isn't it? And then what's been your, what have you sort of seen piecing it together in terms of, you know, how rich the stories you know now are compared to when you first started. Oh, I tell you, um, the stories now are like, I, back then when I started, I just, they were never even thought about it. They, never, they weren't even talked about, you know, back in those days, we were still trying to get, um, introducing kohanga reo, you know? And um, back then, was never, 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 never talked about or never heard about it, but, now these days are more of our you know, rangatahi are learning it, and everyone's learning it really, you know. And it's 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 due to to, I mean, I put it down. I mean, I'm not you know put it down to, to people like myself and us voyagers that have been out there, you know, doing doing voyaging and, and learning all that that Mato um voyaging and stuff. It's it's ignited the stories of old and it's brought back a lot of the stuff that's been never. Never a lot, but never wasn't practiced or not wasn't used, and that's where a lot of it now with the with the, the young generation now, especially the new young voyagers now, which is another level of Matauranga and Puraka and just learning all these amazing stuff that back then I never knew about, which is really cool. Um, and knowing very well that you know now it's going to be, yeah, we ain't going to worry about that anymore. I mean, it's just my whole thing about it is that we don't want to go back and start <laughs> learn it all again. Um, but now, you know, now when our young ones, our young um, voyagers get out and they're going to voyage, the cool thing about it that I like, and I, myself and Jack and Hutu talk about that, uh, we don't, we, we you know, we, we, when we were doing it, we had no support, we had no one to lean back on, pass on Hector, and now, you know, our young ones got us now, you know, to, to, to help them through it, or that they know that we're there. You know, it's a cool thing about it. Um, a lot of them, I, I let them do it. You know, I said, you got to go and do it. You know, you must take that journey. Um, but there's one thing about it, you know, you can, that we're, we're behind you, we're supporting you. But back in our days, it was just like pretty much on our own. We faced the criticism, the everything, everything that just got thrown. But we just stuck to what we wanted to do. And yeah, we just, yeah, it was, a, it was, it was, just, it was, a, it was just that journey we went through and stuff. But was a cool challenge, but but the ocean was was the one that taught us all. <laughs> the ocean is a, the ocean's a big place, but um, beautiful place. But uh, at nights and uh, but oh my god, it's a, it's the most horrible place to be in when it's rough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Steve, have we got any online questions? Uh, yeah, we do have a few questions from online. Um, one of them is: Are there any resources online on Wikipedia or anything like that? for um, the navigation, that was during the navigation part? Yeah, not on Wikipedia, but you can go on some of the websites like um, the Polynesian Voyaging Society. Um, you can go on the, on our Titoki um, Voyaging Trust. Um, there's a lot of um, stuff out there that you can, can use, um, you can look at about voyaging and stuff like that. But the best one is to, to get themselves involved. If you ever have an opportunity to go down to the Maritime Museum at seven o'clock to ten o'clock, they have a waka open day or waka working day, and it's run by our our Titoki uh, Rangatahi, and they they just you just go down there and just just help out, learn out, learn about the waka, learn about 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 navigation, you learn about all sorts of things. That's how you get yourself involved. But the Maritime Museum is a good place to go and find a lot of that stuff out. Yeah. Cool. Another question from online is, uh, does the knowledge from the elders tell of which times of year to travel in different directions? Yep, yep, yep. That's a, that's a, that's, that's a good question. Yep, it sure does. Um, we, don't, we don't go cranking around in the ocean, um, especially up towards the tropics during the summertime, because that's all hurricane season. <laughs> um, if we're leaving here, we'd leave around about, if we're traveling up towards the, um, heading up the tropics, we'll leave around about, just on the beginning, beginning of winter, yeah, just before, yeah, we, it's a good time to 
head our way up there. But we've got to get back out of the tropics before the uh, before uh, end of the latest is at the November, and then we've got to get back here before then. But pretty much, yeah, that time we're up in there, sailing around. Yeah. Um, another couple of questions quickly. Um, which um, of the islands you visited had the closest language to Te Reo? Oh, Easter Island. Oh, apart from the Cook Islands, but Easter Island. Easter Island was very, very, very good thing about Easter Island. It was like, yeah, we pretty much enjoyed each other's um, Kōrero Reo. Um, and then Hawaii. Um, got to think about it. I mean, when you look about the language, it would have been back then, you know, you think it was all Polynesian. Yeah. Māori, but the, the people talk about the old ancient languages, Māori, but back then it was all Polynesian and that they all would have been around then. It's just due to the fact that that ocean distance in terms of the language tweaked a little bit, but we still can, can understand what they're talking about. But Easter Island, Rapa Nui is a, yeah. And that's, that's pretty freaky when you know that you can call it all Māori and they're so far away on the most easternest pinpoint in the middle of the ocean that you can still call it all Māori to them, yeah. Okay, I'll probably pronounce all these wrongly, but another question. Did you get an idea of which Hawaiiki was the earliest Hawaiiki between Savai'i and Samoa, Hawaii, and all the other versions of the same word in different island groups? Yeah, well, there's a different... Um, I remember having a chat with one of the elders that we asked about, you know, we talk about this thing called Hawaiki Nui, Hawaiki Roa, Hawaiki Pao Ma Ma, you know? Um, and we think Hawaiki... Like, you know, we think we're going to, when we pass, we go back to our, our ancestral land, Hawaii. But I was having, myself and we were sitting with a group of elders on this one mochi, that little place called Odede. And um, we talked about that. And I said, oh, you know, I said to them, well, you know, in Maori, I said to them, where do you think Hawaii Nui, Hawaii Roa, Hawaii Pa Ma Ma? And this elder goes, oh, it's all of Polynesia. And I said, I couldn't figure out what you mean. It's talking about the, the middle part, the central part. And I want to show that map about Polynesia. And I talked about the central part where all our wakas, the wakas were sailing around in that part of Polynesia. And all of a sudden they went bang out to those three points. And I asked him, oh, what do you mean? He goes, oh, here. And we showed a map. He goes, this is... He goes, Hawaii Nui, Hawaii Ro, Hawaii Pa Mama. And I was going... I still didn't, didn't click, but he was, to them, it's like the central part of Polynesia is where all the wakas were moving around. Because you go to every single one of the islands I went to, they talk about the same corridor. And that's just the corridor that I got from, you know, about Hawaii. It's that central part where our wakas, all of a sudden, our ancestors branched to those three points of the Polynesian Triangle. So that's just one, but. Yeah, that's, that's different ways where Hawaii knew Hawaii or Hawaii is. Uh, final question, apologies, pronu um, pronunciation isn't my strong suit. Uh, is any of the um, knowledge of the Fitu recorded in the Fakairo? Yep. Yep, that's called it all. It's a place, <clears throat> it's a place up in, if you ever, there's a, there's, a, there's a cave right up in the far north, just below, that they didn't go away to it. There's a cave in there, and it's got some celestial. Um, markings in that cave. Um, very sacred, but there's a place there that's got some markings. And uh, we, um, um, Hector, um, we took nine more down there to show back then in 1983 of those celestial things that were in the caves. But there are, yep, there definitely are. And amongst that, yeah. And, and all of the readings and the writings and all the fucker up it's all there. It's just we. Back then, we never sort of practiced it, but now we are. Mm. Yeah, I've got one last question. Do you think this talk about that the Polynesians that went to Easter Island may have also gone to South America? Mm. Do you think that's possible? And is, yeah, I think. Because uh, that one of the reasons they say that is because of the Kumara is believed yeah. to have come from South America. And it's all throughout Polynesia and even to New Zealand at the Aurora. Yeah, well, so it was done recently. It's got a rocky Why not the Moana did it? <laughs> well, yeah, it's a new science about mm. the Kumara. Uh, and that they, mm. I mean, it definitely came from South America, um, but no no Polynesians ever got to South America. And it wasn't brought back by them because the 
genetic separation between the Coomera in South America and the Coomera in, mm. the, in the Pacific uh, was about 100,000 years. So oh, that's when the two mm. species separated. That's only been able to measure in the last year or two. Mm. Yeah, the other one was a chicken. Oh. Yeah, the chicken was another one. I think there was evidence of them from Chile actually making it to New Zealand. They can like the fairy people or something. Uh, yeah, that's I just think that's real. But you know, I think recently, you know, the 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 you know, the, the, the well, walkers would have did, did that traverse. They would have, man. I think you know, he, he got this. It's just, it's because they're our, our they were explorers. You know, when they found Aotearoa and Hawaii and Easter Island, well, you know, think about it. <laughs> Are you just going to stop there, especially out towards that eastern side? You know, yeah. Who know? I mean. Recently, well, you know, Manau Te Moana sailed seven voyaging, um, voyaging canoes to, to America, you know, and down the, down the, down the side of, uh, of, of the west side of America's, you know, Manau Te Moana, seven voyaging canoes. They did that leg and they did that, that voyage, you know. So, yeah, it's possible. I mean, I'd love to if I had the opportunity, <laughs> you know. But, yeah, it's just, you know, you got to think, we're still trying to figure out. It's just, like I said. It's, it's like you said. It's 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 all that time that well, time between everything is. But yeah, yeah. Now nah, I mean, yeah. It's just yeah. Well, we've done most of it, but well, well, there's opportunity to come around. We'll definitely go. But I mean, our walkers already been there anyway. Our, our those 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 seven um, voyaging canoes um, that sell that leg. They've they've been been to 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 the Americas and down to Mexico and back to the Galapagos. And back to that, so they've done that league, done that run. Yeah, so it's technically quite possible. That, yeah. I mean, the only issue was whether the Kumara was picked up by the yeah. Polynesians from South yeah, America. Yeah, yeah. Basically, what the, the new science is that it wasn't mm. um, the Kumara in the Pacific is separated by mm. you know, evolution by quite a long way, but it doesn't mean that Polynesians never got to South America. Yeah, yeah, well, exactly Something. right. That's, that's right. When they talk about early Polynesians arriving here in Aotearoa, they well, I noticed there's a there's a tree. It's got a chicken and a pig on it. <laughs> there's a little waka down at the pop our little waka, and I, I end up saying to the ladies, "Hey, you need to get the chicken and the pig off the waka because it's <laughs> it ain't it ain't going right." I says, "I could tell you now, you should have had a kiore and a dog." <laughs> hey, I said, "A kiore and a dog." That's what travelled with our wakas, yeah. or with our Polynesian wakas. I said, "Oh, wow!" And I says, "Yeah, yeah." So. You know, mm. many of our uh, waka not only came to Aotearoa, but went back. Mm. Tinana for a start. <coughs> and so it wasn't just to come here and stay here. The waka, yeah. they even were able to navigate back to where they came from. Mm. And that's in our Whakapapa. Mamari and Mamari. They go with one waka. But the name is tweaked as they either came down on one name and then went back and then came down on a different name. Yeah. You know, you look at, uh, yeah, well, you know, you've you got Takitimu, you've got, um, you got Altair, you've got all these wakas that are coming in, but they talk about the cook, the cool, interesting, the, the Cook Islanders, they've got good whakapapa, they've got whakapapa of their wakas, but the ancient, but Takitimu, man, that waka has traversed a lot of ocean. To Altero and gone all the way back again, but still kept that Takitimu name and went backwards and forwards constantly. You know, and that's 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 like in the Cook Island, and they talk about it a lot. You know, they talk about um, Kura Hopo. They talk about these walkers just going there and back, not even you know. And I mean, I'm not saying they just turn around in a couple of days and say, but these these walkers would go back. But then you got to think about, man, the weather back in those days, they, they would have, wouldn't have had to have the problems of pollution and ocean, just problems out that we have today. You know, that's why a lot of people say, oh, you know, I said, but you've got to put yourself back to them. They never had the problems that we have now. You know, they, they were sailing pretty much constantly backwards and forwards, you know, and that, 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 that's, that's, that, that itself is amazing. How that could happen? Change the global weather by then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know how they could bloom and can do that, eh? So that's that's pretty pretty amazing on itself.
I guess we'd, unless there's, we're going to finish, I guess, unless there's some <laughs> questions or somebody could ask afterwards, but um, is there any burning questions? Otherwise, we'll, um, we'll finish. And I'd like to thank Stan again for coming along. It's been a really fascinating talk, and I'm sh look like um, there's a heck of a lot of interest online from what I'm seeing on Steve's screen. So thanks very much for coming along. Um, I'd like, on behalf of the society, I've just got a small gift. Um, this is um, <laughs> so. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.